thank you all for coming and thanks in particular to the volunteers who made this happen uh, i worked with them a bit and they do a lot of work for this so thanks everyone um so i'm jason mancuso um i'm a research scientist at dropout labs uh, we're a startup focusing on privacy preserving machine learning uh building tools and doing research to solve that problem which i'll be talking about today um I'll mainly be talking about why we should care, what people are doing about it, and what we could be doing better. Um, and this is going to be a bit more of a technical talk in the sense that it'll introduce you to a lot of topics you might not be familiar with. And it does, to some extent, assume a basic familiarity with machine learning, but uh, I'll try to explain as much as possible while going through it. Uh, so first, just some motivations for why we should care. Um, so this is a paper recently that came out from Google Brains Group, Nicola Paperno. Um, he argues that uh, when thinking about security and privacy and machine learning, we should um, be taking inspiration from traditional computer security and not reinventing the wheel just because we're doing AI. Um, and so he builds on these principles that were that were published in, in the 70s or 80s, um, the protection of information in computer systems by Salter and Schroeder. Um, and the security principles they dictate, uh, roughly half of them, dictate that uh, in order to make computer systems secure, we need to prevent excessive information flow within these systems. So then without even accounting for adversarial machine learning um, and all the attacks that we've probably heard about throughout, throughout the conference, um, I can confidently make the claim that traditional machine learning is not SNS secure uh, in this way because there is excessive information flow in the form of privacy leakage. So really, privacy is a security problem. Um, but not only that, uh, privacy leakage creates bottlenecks in the existing machine learning uh, process. Um, so here's what I mean by that. Uh, machine learning is a normal workflow where on the left you have uh, some data source, some data generator, whether, whether it's a public data set that's been compiled or it's a private data set owned by, for example, a hospital or some corporation. Um, and so traditionally, when we train machine learning models, we have to aggregate this data somehow uh, in a central place. Um, we engage in training the model. We apply some learning algorithm to it. Uh, I'm, of course, hand-waving away a lot of data science complexity. But um, once we're done with that, we produce this model and deploy it and put it into production. Whether we're actually serving users who are a separate party or serving some inter internal, par internal party uh, within the same organization, uh, there's always going to be some deployment phase where you're running predictions. Um, I mean, this is, this is a, a kind of, this, is, this doesn't fit every use case for machine learning, but it, it describes quite a few of them. Um, and so one thing to notice is that there are multiple parties in the setup. Um, but there is one point of attack that as an attacker, I only really need to, to compromise this middle party, the aggregator, um, to gain access to every asset uh, in this workflow. Um, so this is just to say that, uh, that you know, we do machine learning on private and sensitive data um, where, where there are concerns. And, and machine learning does quite well. This is an example of skin cancer classification. Um, but as a user on the right of... of perhaps taking a picture of, of my mole and uploading it to a cloud somewhere, uh, I might not be incentivized to, to do this, right? Because uh, if I do this, then I'm, I'm revealing whether I have cancer or not uh, to a third party, and I don't know how they're going to use that information. Um, um, so this, this leads to the concept of bottlenecks coming from privacy leakage in the process. Um, and there, there are multiple different points where these bottlenecks occur. Um, so first is actually getting the data for training the machine learning model. Uh, that can, you know, if, if you're if you're part of a security aware organization, a lot of times uh, that can be challenging, right? Get, going through all these hoops to, to get access to data um, is is definitely a bottleneck, and and as a result, we can't actually partner with external organizations to to pool data that should describe the same phenomenon to train better models. In addition, the central party who's doing the actual training takes on a lot of of risk. Um, by aggregating the data in this way, training a machine learning model, and then deploying it. Um, because, of course, aggregating the data, uh, if you're not careful, can lead to data breaches. Um, uh, and then once you deploy the system, you can't be sure how that system is going to be used and who's going to query it, in, in which case there could be attacks uh, that people can do to extract information from that service. 
Um, so this could be in the form of model duplication or, or model theft, where where you've spent all this money creating this, this machine learning model, and someone can come along and just through querying it, they can distill uh, the 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 knowledge that's been that's been encoded in that machine learning model. Um, but of course, uh, you can also perform attacks on machine learning models to extract the training data. For example, model inversion um, does this, where you try to optimize. Once you have a machine learning model, you can optimize for a specific uh, case, and then that will recreate the data, reconstruct the data point that was that was used in the training set. Um, and I'll get into a bit this a bit more as well. Um, and so, and finally, the uh, the incentive problem that I mentioned before is a bottleneck as well, um, where if users aren't incentivized to use the service, um, it's, it's not a good machine learning system, right? Um, so a few possibilities for how we could solve this. I'll just cover these lightly and then dive into them uh, a little more deeply. First is this, is this concept of sanitization, where if we could scrub the data at each point whenever it changes hands by adding noise, um, any single data point in that data set um, will be obfuscated or masked uh, so that if I want to know something about a specific person uh, because of the, the additional noise, I can never be sure if what I'm seeing is their actual data or some, some obfuscation of that. Um, another possibility is that we can move some of these components to different parties. So um, instead of bringing the data to the model, maybe I can bring the model to the data and train the model locally on device. Um, another possibility is encryption. This would be really great, right? If we could just encrypt data and process that data while encrypted and still learn from it, um, then, then we'd, we'd resolve a lot of these privacy problems that we have. So then I'm now going to go into how these, these high level things that I've just mentioned are actually uh, implemented in, in, in research and in production. And I'm going to do so based on these three privacy-preserving primitives, um, differential privacy, federated learning, and secure computation. So first, uh, differential privacy is related to this notion of sanitization that I talked about, where by adding noise, uh, you, can, you can obfuscate the actual data. Um, so this is actually def the definition of differential privacy. Uh, it is somewhat technical, so I'll try to explain it intuitively. Um, so assume we have some data set um, and we're allowed to interactively run queries on that data set as long as those queries aren't give me uh, person A's data, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to query the full data set, maybe run some statistic over it, and, and I'll get that. Um, and that includes uh, this person's data, Alice's data. Um, and so that I can query that same database without Alice's data. And so what happens when I subtract these two results is that I end up just with Alice's data, right? So just, just preventing someone from accessing the single data point isn't enough to actually guarantee the privacy of that data point. So now with differential privacy, what we would do here is we would obfuscate each query with random noise. Um, and then we construct that noise such that the expected difference between these two queries is always going to be as little as possible. So statistically, zero. Uh, in practice, zero is not actually possible, so we use this epsilon number that's, that's slightly greater than zero. Um, so this is really cool because it allows us to actually interact with this data set. Um, and anytime we take subsets of it, um, uh, we can be sure that that is statistically neg negligibly different than other subsets, which means that we can protect our users' privacy in this database. Oh, and that randomized mechanism can also include uh, arbitrary pre- and post-processing, which means that it could be uh, the forward pass of a machine learning model, or it could be the full learning algorithm that produces weights. Um, so this randomized mechanism is essentially just a black box that has some randomness in it. Um, and as long as we can prove that that preserves privacy in this way, um, then we're good. Uh, now, the problem here is that there is a trade-off between privacy and utility. Uh, here's a very simple example where I have some, some set um, and, and I'm going to, every time I query this set, I'm going to add a little bit of noise from a normal distribution. Uh, and then this is the actual expected privacy loss, or this is the, the privacy loss uh, of, of doing this, for example, with averaging. So what then happens as I take this, this number n to infinity, as I make this outlier, uh, or as I turn this, this last number into an extreme outlier, 
Um, what happens is that the privacy cost, even after we we add this this little bit of noise, also goes to infinity, which means that in order to bound this this thing, um, we need to actually take the noise to infinity as well. Um, but if we take that noise to infinity, uh, then we're adding essentially arbitrarily more noise. And, and any statistic that we take from the set is just going to be meaningless because it's just completely noisy now. Um, so this is a problem in general for databases, but it, for machine learning, it's actually, it's actually quite nice um, because in machine learning, we care about general patterns. Uh, we want to we wanna pull general patterns from large data sets, and we don't care so much about outliers uh, and unique points. We usually remove those if possible, um, for at least for, for many applications. Um, so what's nice about this approach is that we have a mathematically rigorous way of proving that our system is private in this way. And the, in, in this way, when I say that, this notion of privacy is actually very strong. Um, it protects against a broad range of attacks, like membership inference, uh, re-identification attacks, set differencing, model inversion, these, these types of things that are in the literature. Um, and it also gives us this, this intuitive notion of a privacy budget, this epsilon number that, that we talked about, how, how negligible different statistics are or different predictions are. Uh, that, that, that becomes a privacy budget because if you, if you query the same query a number of times, the randomness will eventually, because it's zero-centered noise, will eventually target in on the right value. So we can, we can say, as a user, you can only interact with this data set or this model uh, so many times before you've maximized, you, you, you've, you've outdone your privacy budget uh, and you can no longer interact with the system. Um, so there are a lot, there's a lot of machine learning research going into this. Um, just from Google's group, there's DPSGD, which the idea here is that you can add the noise. Instead of adding it to the data, you can no add it to the gradients that are produced during stochastic gradient descent while training your model. Um, and then you can prove that this actually produces weights that are differentially private, that don't leak anything about the underlying data set. Um, Pate is another one. This uses model ensembles and, and uh, distilling information from those ensembles in a way that the final model is, is differentially private. Um, there, there's a lot of research going on into new definitions for this kind of thing, differential privacy, and, and providing new proof techniques, and then also coming up with new mechanisms, new randomized mechanisms, um, to improve the privacy utility trade-off that I talked about. But some open questions, I mean, differential privacy is a very strong guarantee, but it's not everything. Uh, for example, if other users are contributing data to train a model, um, I don't need to actually contribute my data to that in order to experience privacy loss. Uh, people can just run that model once it's trained on me, and then I've experienced privacy loss that's contagious uh, through those other people. Um, we currently really don't have any uh, solutions to this yet, but it is a very big open question. Um, so differential privacy, it does solve some of these bottlenecks. Um, so data access, you, you can scrub data at any point. You can scrub any component of the system with noise uh, and then prove with differential privacy that it pre preserves privacy. But the problem is that if you do this too much, if you add too much noise, the utility of the whole system kind of, kind of falls apart. Uh, so maybe the user is no longer incentivized to use your service and, and it, it's pointless, right? Um, so that, that moves us towards different primitives. Uh, one that I'll talk about now is federated learning where we actually just take the model and train it on device. Um, Google is really well known for this. They do this on uh, thousands, millions of, of devices. Um, and, and that's a very specific use case. Uh, when you do that, you have low, avail low availability uh, data owners or parties with low resources um, and then low bandwidth. And uh, so this is kind of a, a very tricky way of doing on-device learning, but in general, you can do this. You can you can imagine doing this between, you know, five or ten hospitals. In which case, they can ramp up servers with GPUs and 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 have strong network connections between them and always be available. Uh, so this is actually a, a viable avenue for for training data or for training machine learning models in a non-standard way. Um, so what's nice about this is that we don't centralize the raw data, uh, which removes some of the excessive information flow I talked about. Um, in particular, the data access problem because you never have to centralize it. Um, and perhaps users are incentivized to use your service if they know that uh, you're only doing the, the predictions on device and, and they're never actually sending their data to you. 
Um, but the problem is that our, our risk management uh, is not actually that strong. And, and the, the guarantee, there, there's no guarantee that me as the designer of the service isn't actually going to peek at your data uh, when I want to or need to, right? So we have no privacy guarantee like we had in differential privacy. Uh, and the other problem is that the model is exposed. When we send the model to do training on these arbitrary data owners, we now have to treat them as adversaries uh, because they could potentially uh, try to influence that process in a way that's that's advantageous to them. Um, and or uh, assuming you know, if you're training a machine learning model a, amongst a bunch of parties, at some point, someone, one of those parties, is going to end up with a model that is essentially the same as the final model, which means this asset that this this asset that you've you've trained is is now up for grabs. Um, so, this is not an ideal approach, but it does offer maybe some some additional privacy that we don't have in the current paradigm. Okay, so. What if we could try to accomplish the same thing we're trying to do with federated learning, but add in some kind of privacy guarantee back uh, without maybe adding so much noise that the, the service doesn't work anymore? And this is kind of the, the notion behind uh, secure computation. This is research from the 80s. Um, the, the, the general idea is how can we compute a publicly known function uh, while the inputs and outputs of that function are kept private? And, and private here is usually defined similarly to how it is in, in standard encryption, like in, in communication encryption, for example. Um, so again, just to reiterate that, uh, we have this publicly known function and we want to evaluate it uh, without knowing the inputs and outputs necessarily. Um, and this, this function could be the forward pass of a machine learning model, or it could also be the entire learning algorithm. right? So we can, we can do training or inference uh, in this way if we can do so. And, and how we actually do it is we find some function uh, that is homomorphic through F. And this just means that you can uh, you can encrypt the inputs and run the function the same way and end up with an encrypted output that you can then decrypt. That's this bottom line. You have this encryptor and this decryptor. The encryptor is homomorphic through the function. The decryptor is cryptographically hard to determine unless you have uh, some of the inputs to the function. Um, and in the rest of this talk, I'll refer to this as like the homomorphic paradigm for machine learning because it's, it's the, the the dominant one. Um, there are actually a lot of different ways um, to do this secure computation. There are a lot of techniques, and they all have different trade-offs. So the main takeaways of this is just that um, there are a lot of them. They're not directly comp comparable because they all have slightly different threat models. Um, there is no silver bullet, and actually most state-of-the-art protocols uh, are using some combination of these different approaches. Um, we'll focus in a bit on secret sharing just to demonstrate how this applies to machine learning. Um, so for example, if you wanted to run inference on uh, a simple linear model uh, without exposing the data privacy, uh, you could encrypt the inputs to the, to the data. Here we call it secret sharing. What we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of randomness and subtract it from uh, the data point. Uh, that randomness is then um, it's called a one-time pad. It's extremely secure. Now we have three components. We have the original data point, and we have these two masked versions of it. So if I want to compute uh, this, this forward pass, this linear regression with someone, I send them one of those shares. Uh, we essentially do a public multiplication with, with the weights, uh, and then a private addition between the, the components in this vector. This is just a, a simple dot product. Um, and, and what it ends up doing is, is we, we can end up with an encrypted version of the final result. And so if we reconstruct, if we send the shares of that, of that output back to each other, we can reveal the answer uh, of, of the machine learning model's inference. Um, and we can actually do this while securing the weights too. We can just treat the weights as another input to this function of a dot product um, and, and, and do it just like that. It gets a little more complicated and it gets slower, um, but it is possible. And so this matrix math is, is actually really conducive to secure computation, uh, which is why uh, this is actually a, a potential approach that we could do to, to do this and scale this. Um, so once you move past simple dot products, you can actually scale this up to larger models um, and, and do a lot of interesting things with it. So past just prediction, you can do training. Uh, this is an example of server-aided training where all the data sources on the left um, Instead of aggregating their plain text data, they will encrypt the data and send it to these two servers. Uh, and the two servers now will engage in some computation with each other. 
they do a lot of, com- of communication back and forth to be able to do this. But in the end result, you end up with a shared machine learning model uh, that is that is kept private. That is that where where the final party who wants to deploy this model never had access to the to the actual raw data. They only had access to an encrypted version of it. Um, so what's what's nice here is that we're able to run machine learning models on encrypted data. Uh, what's bad about this in particular with secret sharing is that there's the possibility that these two servers will collude with each other to reveal the data and break the privacy guarantee. Um, so there are secure computation techniques without that. That's just one particular one that's that's uh, a problem. Um, and so instead of centralizing the, the encrypted data on these two servers, you could uh, think of just doing the multi-party, the, the secure computation between these parties directly and, and never centralizing any data. Uh, and you can do this just fine. It just gets slower. Um, this, uh, this, this research field is a long history. Um, on the left here, we have mainly research papers that are applying secure computation to machine learning, but secure computation has a long history before machine learning was, was during, during the AI winters, right? Um, and uh, on the right, we have some general secure computation frameworks that people have implemented machine learning algorithms in on top of. Um, and on the bottom, we have these two specialized projects that are actually, um, instead of using these generic, like kind of academic C++ libraries, they're trying to build privacy-preserving machine learning primitives into um, the frameworks that people are, are familiar with, uh, in particular TensorFlow and Py- PyTorch. And I've, I'll talk a little bit about that more later. So some open questions around secure computation. As I mentioned a few times, uh, it is extremely slow to do this. Right now, we, we can't actually scale this to, for example, a 152-layer neural network. Um, we, can, we can do pretty well, but, but that's, that's currently out of reach. So the question then becomes, can we ever account for that? Can we, can we make that cost, that extra performance cost, marginal, um, as opposed to uh, really central? Um, uh, but if, if not, I mean, secure computation for machine learning can still enable uh, applications of machine learning that current aren't, le- aren't possible uh, today uh, just because of privacy concerns, for example, regulatory competitive or sensitivity issues. Um, and so, but the question to maybe, uh, or to answer this, this question about marginal cost, can we combine MPC with other approaches that are faster um, to maintain some of its privacy guarantee without, um, without totally uh, ruining the speed of machine learning? Um, and there's, there's a good example that Google put out there called secure aggregation, where they apply this to federated learning to, to give it some kind of privacy guarantee. Um, and similar uh, to what people are doing with differential privacy now, can we think of alternative definitions for privacy and security uh, that allow us to 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 perform this in a more performant way, or to, to to run machine learning in a more performant way while still preserving that notion of privacy, as opposed to the strong information theoretic privacy that we see from from secure computation? And then that's some of what I want to talk about. Uh, in particular, it's, it's part of my research as well. Is that I'd, I'd like to answer this question. So just to summarize real quickly on secure computation. Um, so what it does is, is it, it gives us very strong guarantees um, for accessing data and preventing, preventing unfettered access to data, uh, which helps with the data access problem, uh, with the risk management problem, uh, and also with the incentive problem, because you can do predictions in this way uh, and have formal guarantees around, around the user's privacy. Um, it does not actually prevent these differencing attacks and model inversion attacks that I talked about with differential privacy, um, but because differential privacy works, uh, we can combine it with MPC or secure computation um, to actually get like a full, uh, a full privacy-preserving workflow with full, strong information-theoretic guarantees um, for preserving privacy of the different parts of the system. Okay, so now that I've talked about the primitives and, and what people have been doing for the past 20 years, um, let's look a bit at current research, what's happening now, um, and how we should prioritize them. Um, so a big focus right now is on designing systems and tools that make this easier to use. Um, this is a paper that we, we produced uh, it's it's doing secure computation in TensorFlow, uh, which is of course the 
dominant uh, deep learning framework, um, largely s swallowing up more and more of the ecosystem uh, as Google marches it out. Um, and so what we, what we were able to do is use the distributed computation engine in TensorFlow um, to perform secure computation through secret sharing. And we found that because they've put so much work into uh, that distributed orchestration, uh, it's actually a very convenient way of expressing these secure computations, and it's extremely efficient. Um, so th this is on GitHub. It's open source. You can check it out. Um, Google themselves has, has published a few uh, code libraries around this stuff. Uh, on the left, Google's federated learning team has, has produced TensorFlow Federated, which, which is all about doing federated learning in TensorFlow. Uh, on the right, TensorFlow Privacy, which is more around differential privacy and training differentially private models. Um, so now these three primitives are each available inside of TensorFlow. Uh, if you're familiar with that, you can play, play with these. Um, they're not totally integrated yet, but we're working on it. Um, another uh, thing that we just did recently was, was a, a different kind of secure computation is called homomorph encryption, which is much closer to public private key uh, cryptography, but just designing those that, that crypto system so that you can still do the computations. Um, Microsoft has a has a really well known package called Seal. It's highly optimized for doing this, um, and we were able to bridge TensorFlow, TensorFlow with Microsoft Seal, so you can do homomorph encryption as well as opposed to just uh, multi party computation. Um, and then we've also experimented with with deploying TensorFlow models in secure enclaves and trusted execution environments, in particular uh, Intel SGX. Uh, and so we have a project out uh, that actually that that won a uh, Google and Intel cloud confidential cloud computing competition. Um, so that's that's pretty cool to check out. Um, and then there's another paper kind of doing a similar thing uh, from a group or community called Open Mind. It's currently probably the largest community of people interested in privacy preserving machine learning. Um, it's run by Andrew Trask, who is a research scientist at DMind and a a student at the University of Oxford. Um, and this is uh, essentially building these three primitives into a, f in a system that's integrated from the beginning. Uh, whereas these TensorFlow projects have kind of started off in different groups, and then and then so that they're they exist, you, they're they're pretty performant, but they're not well integrated. Um, this this project is more around having an ecosystem that's that's very highly integrated uh, with itself. Um, and so I, I was I was involved in the early days of this one too, and and uh, it was recently. Um, Featured as a as a free course on Udacity, um, sponsored by Facebook, uh, and if you, if you're interested in playing around with these actual these primitives in a way that's uh, really accessible, um, you can you can take this course for free, and it it'll it'll introduce you to um, to these techniques using PyTorch, which is the system that we built uh, in this paper. Um, so beyond systems and tools, there are some larger questions that we still have to figure out as a community. Um, the question of centralization is, of course, uh, a big one. Um, if, if we're going to centralize things, uh, how much should we centralize and how should we centralize them? Um, unfortunately, this question has become quite heavily skewed with a lot of the blockchain hype train. Um, so, for example, SingularityNet, if you've seen Sophia the Robot, they're all about this, combining blockchain with AI in a decentralized way, and uh, that can be distracting, for sure. Um, but... One good thing about this is that um, with the blockchain hype has come this interest in economics uh, and, and machine learning and their combination. So if everyone had control over their personal data through privacy-preserving machine learning, it could be possible that data would turn into a liquid asset, uh, which has pretty strong implications for how we do machine learning now and, and the notion of like a, a data economy or, or a data marketplace. Um, this then makes you wonder how you might price a trained machine learning model or how you might value the underlying training set that was used to produce that model. Um, so corporations estimate the cost and value of machine learning models all the time, um, but no one's really pricing data in this context. So uh, that's kind of an, a nice open area. Uh, that was recently um, brought up in, in this ICML paper uh, from 2019. It was from a group at Stanford. Uh, it's called Data Shapely, uh, estimating the you know, valuation of data. And what they found is that it's really interesting that data that's uh, outliers are worth less than data that's representative of the pattern you're trying to learn, which is somewhat not surprising, but it's also really helpful uh, because as I mentioned before, differential privacy is really strong 
unless you have these outliers. So what turns out to be valuable data lends itself well to differential privacy and the utility privacy trade-off uh, that I mentioned before. This is super cool. I love this paper. Um, but and, and it's really unfamiliar to me as, like a, as a machine learning person because it focuses on estimating economic values and stuff. But uh, I will come back to it in a bit. So moving on to secure computation, this is like with differential privacy and secure computation, these are probably the two main uh, main strong guarantee, uh, big primitives that we would really like to see uh, all machine learning done in if it could be, right? Because they're very, they're very secure, they're very strong. Uh, and the main problem is just that we can't scale them to all the applications that we see today. Um, so we do have a kind of slight advantage in machine learning. I mean, so the timeline here is essentially that, you know, you have these general secure computation techniques and frameworks, and people were just optimizing those for generic computation. Then when people started applying it to machine learning, they realized that, oh, well, all these optimizations are actually really convenient for matrix math and then the stuff that machine learning uses. And then now, actually, it's going... So, so people were saying, all right, how can we mix and match these different protocols to improve the performance for machine learning models? Uh, but now we're going to the point where we're saying, well, how can we tweak the machine learning models to make it more efficient in this encrypted space? That's a lot of the work that we've done at Dropout. Um, so for generic secure computation, um, it's unacceptable for a function to, to evaluate differently than it would have in, in the plain text. Um, but for machine learning, we don't really care about specific examples um, because we're already approximating some ideal function. So if it's better to just find some other approximation uh, that, that runs more efficiently, we can do that as long as the performance is roughly the same. Um, so we're seeing quick wins by just adapting machine learning, tweaking, for example, the, the activation functions we use or going from max pooling to average pooling or something like this in a, in a deep neural network. And we're seeing big wins there. Um, so then... The question becomes, is there an upper bound on those quick wins? Um, and so I tried to formalize this, this question. Um, I phrased it as like this no free lunch hypothesis, essentially just given like this, this machine learning algorithm, can you find a, a roughly equivalent version of it in the sense of runtime, um, but also in, in its security? Or sorry, uh, in terms of runtime and in terms of generalization performance, but with the requirement that it can be computed securely um, and the difference is negligible. Uh, so this is that in pictures. Um, in theory, anything that you can compute in plain text should be computable in, in a secure way. Uh, but in practice, efficiency just constrains um, what we can actually do. But if this hypothesis were to be true, uh, then that actually wouldn't be the case. There would always, at least for machine learning, there, was always, there would always be some slightly different machine learning model that runs as fast, um, but securely. So the problem with this is that the way we prove security in MPC does not lend itself well to this. Um, this is an undecidable uh, statement uh, when, you, when you look at how we prove security. Uh, it's, it's called the simulation paradigm, if, if you're interested in that. Um, so maybe we need a new concept of security to be able to actually answer this question in a way that's, that's helpful. So just to reiterate one thing here, um, with federated learning and secure computation, we have this threat model dilemma where the one that scales doesn't have a strong security guarantee, uh, the one that doesn't scale does, and how do we reconcile this? Um, I would propose, what I am proposing, is to analyze the incentives of everyone in this in this machine learning game treated as an adversarial game where where anyone could steal the other person's uh, asset if it's worth their time. So if you knew the utility function of each party in this private machine learning game, um, instead of relying on computational hardness and infra information theory, um, you can rely on the fact that they're motivated and that you know their motivations, and then you can use game theory to prove security. Um, and so because you understand, that's only because you can understand their, their motivations and also only because you can price the different components in this, in this system, in particular data and models. If you can price those, you can do this. Now that's where the, the details lie and, and that's where we still need to figure things out. 
But this has a long history as well, actually. It's called rational cryptography. Now, it failed to take hold um, because it was trying to solve generic cryptography problems. Um, and utility functions are extremely hard to estimate in those generic cases. Um, but as I've been saying, in private machine learning, we only ever need to estimate the utility of those two things, data and models, or pieces of models. Um, and we already have ways of doing this in both cases. So if we can do this, it could give us MPC protocols that are faster, but still provably secure. Um, and we can use this to derive security guarantees for federated learning, uh, in particular just to see like just how weak that guarantee is for a specific use case. So in conclusion, privacy is a, is a security problem. Um, that security problem creates leakages or bottlenecks rather in the, in the, in the current paradigm of machine learning. And these techniques that I've been talking about, differential privacy, federated learning, and secure computation, can alleviate those bottlenecks if you allow them to. Um, the field is really wide open. There's not many people working on this, but it is, it is a very exciting area to be in. Um, and there are now packages and tools that you can pull down from GitHub and play around with this stuff uh, on your local computer in a matter of minutes. Um, to me, that's like a really strong recipe for, for people in security and machine learning to, to experiment with and, and just to play with the stuff. So uh, thank you for your time. I've included some resources and we'll get these slides up uh, so you can play around with it if you want. Thanks. Yeah, so actually, unfortunately, I would say, I mean, detection uh, is is hard. Um, I mean, in particular, for federated learning, this is a huge problem because you're just sending the model out. They can do whatever they want. They can optimize it however they want. They can feed with it whatever data they want. Um, there are defenses. So this field is called Byzantine Resilient Machine Learning. Uh, it's still new as well. Um, what's nice about secure computation, though, is that you can force... You can, you can construct the protocol so that it's impossible for people to add computation to the function evaluation. So they can only ever um, follow the protocol in lockstep. And if they deviate at any point and try to modify the result in a way that's, that's unanticipated, um, the protocol will just break. It will just not work. Um, uh, this is the difference between passive security and active security in the, in the field. Um, so the, there are some defenses, um, and even in federated learning, for example, at the aggregation step where you aggregate the different parties' updates, instead of just doing an average, you can do the median of those of those updates, and then the median is much more robust to these outliers that would much more likely be uh, or data poisoning poison data would be much more likely to be an outlier. Um, relative to the distribution, so that's uh, that's kind of the the current trend uh, around that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but to push a median, you have to go really far, right? You have to you have to actually you have to control like a lot of the data. You can't just do it with one point. You have to do it with like uh, a large subset. So yeah, it's so you can get resiliency up to like a third or a half of the of the parties um but going past that is extremely difficult so secure computation that's not the case you can do if there's n parties n minus one of them can be corrupt and you still cannot break security um so that's kind of another nice feature of it yeah Yeah, so the question was, uh, why are some models uh, more efficient than others in the encrypted space, essentially, right? Um, well, the answer, I mean, it depends on what, which technique you're using. Um, so there's this big list of them. Uh, this one. 
Um, so that's actually only true for these three on the right. Secure enclaves are can handle arbitrary computation, and it's roughly as fast as as regular. And the problem there being that there are demonstrated side channel attacks on these enclaves, so they're they're not as secure potentially as as the ones on the right. Um, and the ones on the right have different operations that they're optimized for. So garbled circuits is really efficient for comparing items. So if you, you essentially build a Boolean circuit and you scramble it in a way that's privacy preserving and then you evaluate that circuit, um, which lends itself really well to taking maximums and stuff like that. Um, but for like matrix multiplication, for example, it's a lot harder to get down to a binary circuit with that. Um, but so, and garbled circuits have some other problems. So most of the people right now are, are doing homomorphic encryption or, or secret sharing. Those are really optimized for arithmetic. So addition, multiplication, um, but taking comparisons, for example, just doing a ReLU is actually really expensive uh, with those because, because that, that, that doesn't fit into, you know, arithmetic. Um, so, so there is like a, a theoretical understanding of why, uh, different things are faster. It's more just figuring out how you can stay within those confines, but still learn all the same things you can learn with like a normal machine learning model. For example, if you if you remove ReLU and replace it with something that's arithmetic based, can you still get the same learning capacity? Um, and that's, I mean, one of our interns is actually running some experiments around that, so that's, uh, yeah. Uh, can you repeat that? By knowing the model, you can somehow guess what is the encryption for encrypting the data. Is it a privacy violation or not? No. In general, the, the function, the protocol of encrypting these things is known ahead of time. What's what's not known is that the ran the randomness used uh, in in the specific mechanism. Um, it's 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 kind of the same way that public private key cryptography works. Um, yeah, just a little bit different setup. So. If you get the key, however, then yes, you can break. Uh, so in homomorphic encryption, that that is a, a hardness question. In in MPC, it's a it's a collusion question. Um, but yeah, cool. Any more? Or no. Cool. Thanks.